friends, Jerry Rosa here at the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. We're on to the second half of building this mandolin. <laughs> uh, you recall in the last video, this is what the uh, mandolin looked like. So it's ready for part one of the beautification stage. And this one is kind of the transition stage, and that is that we still have to make the fretboard. So we're making something uh, that actually is part of the mandolin, but yet it's part of the beauty of the way I think of it, too, because the fretboard uh, kind of makes or breaks uh, an instrument, you know, in terms of looks and uh, also playability and all that. I uh, used to make my fretboards from scratch, cut all the slots in them and everything. I just found that was just kind of a wasted effort. Uh, I, can't, I can't improve upon what I can buy, so I just buy them pre-slotted at this point. Uh, and I uh, have a template here, and I've uh, traced the, the center line down the center of this, and we're going to lay my template on here on the center line. I just thought I'd point this out, not that it really makes any difference, but uh, yeah, I think of these as being so precisely machined and everything, and the width down here was 1.3 or 1.932. Up here it was 1.946. That's a difference of a, what about 12,000 or 14 thousandths? I guess it is. Yeah, 14 thousandths. Not that big a deal. If you're splitting hairs, it's like about three to four hairs. So anyway, um, not much difference, but it is different. So I just thought I'd point that out. So we've, anyway, we've got this on the center line and drawing uh, down through here. We're going to draw our template on here right now. All right, so I want to get this as precise as I can. Get it right on the center line at the nut area there. And I've got a center line on this. And I put it on the center line. And then I try to hold it where it doesn't move at all. My template is a little oversized actually, so I'm not concerned that I won't have enough material because I always do. It's It truly is a little oversized, though they uh, barely make these long enough anymore. They used to have them long enough where you'd always have something to cut off there on the end, but they don't give you that little bit anymore, do they? they you can see it runs right to the end. Everybody's cutting back and watching expenses and trying to make everything as efficient as possible these days. Can't hardly blame them, I guess. All right. So we've got that traced out and we'll go cut that out on the bandsaw. Got it roughed out and uh, I'm going to uh, clean it up now with some files and just make it look better. Well, you know, this is all going to be scalloped anyway, but I like to file it before I scallop it. It just, uh, I don't know, there's more meat there. It just feels more, uh, I don't know, substantial to file on, I guess you'd say. I might add that I also put the binding on it before I scallop it. I find it easier to scallop, or, you know, attach the binding while it's thick, and then you can scallop it all together and it comes off real easy. It could be done the other way, I guess, but that's just the way I do it. I'm not going to spend much more time than that on it. That's got it pretty cleaned up. The uh, reason is we're going to end up narrowing this down a little bit more when we fit the binding to the neck and make sure it all fits. I just wanted to get it close uh, for a starting point here. We're going to be about like that on the uh, mandolin. You can start to see what it's going to look like there. It's looking pretty good. It's a, I can tell it's quite wide. It, because once the binding goes on here, the binding has to fit on top of the neck here yet too. So we're going to start working on making the binding and this all fit. I 
I've got the binding here that I intend to use on it, and uh, you can see that uh, you know it's a ivoryed uh, black and then a white, and it's a nice binding. It's it's really the body binding, and it it's just a hair thicker than I would like. It measures at ninety four thousandths. The best I can tell is the ivory outer thickness is 50 thousandths and the inner two together, uh, they're 20 thousandths a piece, so it's 40 thousandths, so it's about 90 thousandths total. I'm thinking about uh, knocking about 15 thousandths off of the ivory and that'll cut it quite a bit down and knock, you know, in a... In, That'll be a total of 30 thousandths narrower down the, the width of the fretboard. I think that'll still look real good, and I think you know it'll match the body binding, but yet it'll be a little bit more delicate on the fretboard, and I think that's what I'm going for. So I'm going to knock this down uh, with my homemade thickness sander and see how that works. Uh, it may turn out to be a disaster. You just never know. Well, I decided to change my business plan here. I decided to... Uh, Go ahead and laminate uh, this plastic binding on here before I thin this down. And uh, I would like to have that trim on the bottom of the uh, binding on the pegboard. And of course you have to laminate that, it doesn't come that way. And so I've got my little uh, jig uh, here, from, and this is a Stumac jig. You know, I've got it in my vise, and so this has spring tension on it to hold the two laminates together. And what I'm using here is some acetone to melt the two plastics together. Now, I haven't laminated it up there yet. I'm just going to start right here in the middle, and I'll push it through. And by the time I get it pushed through, the idea is, or at least I hope the idea is, that that will uh, cement that part in place. I'll come through and, uh, you know hopefully melt the ends together now. I uh, like to give it plenty of time for the acetone to kind of melt the plastic. That's what it's actually doing and it's kind of melting, fusing the two pieces together is what you're hoping that's happening anyway. I thought it would be easier to do it this way and then thickness it down to my thickness that I want for the fretboard. I believe that's laminated pretty well. You can see it here. Now, I like to give that time um, for it to really completely dry. So I'm not going to go ahead and do the clean, or I'm not going to do the uh, thicknessing on this right away. That looks pretty good actually. Pretty happy with that. So. We'll just let that set aside there and, and dry for a while. And we'll do the same thing with this, with the longer piece for the other side. I did that one kind of backwards. I usually do it from this side going this way. And I'm going to try that this time and see if that works better. It doesn't really make any difference. It's just as long as you get the job done. I would say there is a slight advantage of going the opposite way. This this is easier to paint the stuff on, but there's a better advantage going the other way as it keeps it flatter. This wants to curl down the natural curl of the plastic. And that's what she looks like. Now the underneath binding is a little taller, so this will have to be cut down to the thickness of this, but I can take care of that all with my thickness sander, I believe. Um, anyway, I'm going to have to let that set for several hours and let it really dry good. Uh, it, the plastic's soft and it just takes a while for it to heal and to get hard again. The binding has been sitting overnight and I'm cleaning up the back. You can see this side's dirty, this side's clean. The reason I'm cleaning up the back is I want it good and flat before I run it through my thickness sander. And, you know, I want to make sure that the new little strip that I glued on there is uh, same level as the back of the binding. I don't want it sticking up proud or anything and then causing a, a wave in the binding when I 
grind it to thickness. Okay, that piece is cleaned up on the back and nice and flat. Now we'll do the other piece. I left the little new piece sticking out a little bit past the end and I'm going to go ahead and just chop that off real quick. We're ready to uh, try this through the thick thickness sander I think. I'm a little bit leery that the fact that this new piece is sticking up so high so I may just go ahead and knock it down to the level of the other piece before I do this. I'd feel more comfortable. I'm afraid it'll kink in there and, and screw up the binding. Feels nice. Uh, looks real nice. It's, it's nice and smooth and clean now, level together. Uh, it feels like it bonded real well, which is a real good thing. Clean up this other little shorter piece now. I'm going to call that good. I got it down to about 79 thousandths from roughly 94 thousandths. So I'm just going to call that good enough. And uh, it's thinner now and it'll be a little more delicate as binding for the fretboard. Well, interruptions abounded yesterday as well. And uh, it's been another day since I was working on this. I didn't get much further. You know, we had thin, thinned down the... Uh, the binding and I like the way the binding looks now and what I did was then I set this on the neck of the mandolin and it was going to be obviously too wide I checked my specs on the uh, uh, Lloyd lower neck and uh, it definitely was too wide so what I did was I uh, you know uh, marked on here the how much I needed to take off on both sides and I put it on my belt sander and uh, watched the line and then it's just about the time the line uh, was about uh, almost to disappear then we stopped we ch rechecked it and uh, boy it's as close to perfection as I can get uh, you know for fitting and being and matching the lower specs as well so it's time now to uh, go the next step on the fretboard, and that is installing the frets. I uh, install the frets before I put the binding on, and the reason for that is because I make my binding come up to the ends of the frets and cover the ends of the frets. That's just the way I do it. This table, as I've mentioned before, is very hard. It works great as a surface to uh, put the frets in on. I just happen to have a, a piece of cut off fret here that was left over from the last fret job and it's going to match the width of this just perfectly. It's, it's just a hair wider than what I need which is what I always want and we'll file them all flush later. I've got a piece of aluminum here that I used so that it doesn't mar the fret and it starts driving it down in there. make sure they're really seated well and now the way I do it is I just uh, put them in here and I cut them off as I go uh, some people cut them off ahead of time I cut them off as I go and then that way I'm not wasting any material at all it's difficult to get these these fret slots are tight and uh, these fret wires don't always like to go down in there And the way I cut them off is I just take my nippers and put them right up against the the fretboard and uh, that nips them off just a hair long and it works out perfectly and that's because there's an inside little tiny bevel on these nippers and so it leaves them just a hair longer than they need to be which is perfect.
Off camera, I've done a lot of work. I finished up the frets and I've marked the center line down there through there again. And uh, then I've also just made a little punch mark where each dot's going to go. And at the 12th fret, I've got the two dots there. And once again, I didn't really film it, but I drilled the holes uh, on the drill press. And uh, now we're going to put these dots in place. Well, here it is Friday. I started this fretboard project on Monday. Ordinarily, I can do one of these, the whole thing, in a, in a morning. Well, you can see how many mornings it's been. I cannot believe the interruptions I've had this week. It's just, on, it's just crazy. And my wife and my daughter are here right now, and they're both wanting me to go out and help them with their fence they're building for their horse. What I'm getting ready to do, I didn't bother filming what little bit of time I could find to work on this. I bent this plastic. Well, first of all, I think I did film putting this little strip on here, laminating that bottom strip on there. And now I've bent it. I just took a heat gun and bent it with a heat gun to match the profile of the uh, fretboard here. I have a very smooth 2x4, just a off cut off piece that I found in my scrap pile and I'm going to use that for my tabletop for gluing this on and um, I'm going to put this parchment I, I would prefer wax paper but I, I only had the wife only had parchment paper in stock at the moment so I'm going to use parchment paper and uh, that way it'll help keep from gluing it to the wood okay so uh, there's a lot of different ways to do this. This is just one of the ways that I do it. And uh, it's the way I chose this morning. I don't know why exactly, but it is. Alright, so what I do first is just get me a straight line going with two points. Driving in two little nails. And, uh, you know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So... We've got our two points in here, and now we've, we've got a straight line established. And I can use that straight line to push against. I'm just making sure the nails are fairly plumb so that they'll push against the whole binding. That looks good. All right, so what I'm going to do first is just get glue on this and get this binding in place and just sitting there. All right, that clamp helps hold it flat. Matter of fact, I'll probably just put another one there too. Okay, we're going to let that set up. Gives you a little zoom in there so you can see it maybe a little closer of what I've actually done there. I'm in the metal shop and I have a 5 16 inch hex nut chucked up in here. And it will work on a 3 16 inch rod, which will be the truss rod for the mandolin. 
Now I'm going to cut a little taper on the end of that nut and we're going to give it a shot and see what happens. See what that looks like. All right, it's not doing too bad. I think I'd like a slightly steeper taper than that. So we'll bring it up here and we'll adjust the taper. I was gonna do a 30 degree taper to begin with and I ended up doing a 40 degree because I thought, well, the 30 might be too flat. Maybe 35. All right, I got it set on 34 right there. I'll just go with 34 and see what that looks like. It's just an arbitrary thing, and it's just a looks thing, and, and to fit inside the uh, truss rod area real nice. And so here we go. That looks pretty good. I kind of like the looks of that. I think I'll just go with that. I think that looks pretty good. Now I'll just get that out of the way. And uh, I could use a file there, but it's awful close to these jaws. I think I'll just try this little sandpaper. That seems like that might have done all right. Might need a little bit of hand work. But I think that's going to work. So let's take her out of there and see what we ended up with. That's what we got. I don't know if the camera's actually focusing on that or not, but let's see if it is. And that's what we ended up with. Now we'll cut it off back here a little ways. And that'll be the tapered nut for the truss rod. Well, if the video in the other room turned out, you saw how I tapered this uh, nut. Uh, it's far too long, but we can always saw it off to the right length after we're done working on it. I'm just going to do a little hand clean up on it uh, just to make it look a little bit better. Take a, this is a very fine file. There's like a little burr here. I'm just going to get rid of the burr on the corner there. Okay, now we'll uh, cut her off to a certain length here. I took the easy way, I put it back in a three jaw chuck and just took a regular hacksaw and sawed it off. That was quick and easy. Now I'm just gonna bevel the edges. And we got our cleaned up there and looking pretty good. So that's going to be the nut for the truss rod.